Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this webinar about these two MSc courses uh, that we offer. My name is Simon Waldman. I'll introduce myself and the other team members you're going to see in a couple of minutes. But first, let me introduce the director of the Energy and Environment Institute, uh, Professor Dan Parsons. Thanks, Simon, and, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Dan Parsons. I direct the Energy and Environment Institute here at the University of Hull. Um, and welcome to, to this evening's uh, this, the, the webinar, um, which will cover two of our um, two of our masters programs that we have we have running um, here at Hull. Uh, one centred on renewable energy, and the other one on environmental change management and monitoring. And and these two masters, the, the flagship programs, really that that really um, exemplify and, uh, and and highlight the. The interface that the institute focuses on, and that's that's all around sustainable energy, um, climate change, and and uh, a low carbon uh, transition, a low carbon net zero future, um, and all of those things can't really be decoupled. You you can't address one without the other. Energy and environment are intricately linked together. So the ethos of the institute is to bring together the expertise across the university across all of the different disciplines you may be currently in, in terms of your undergraduate programme, and bring them together into a, a greater whole, so that, so that when we're addressing the, uh, the needs of society um, and, and addressing climate change and the future challenges that we have, we bring all that interdisciplinary expertise together into one place. And that's really where the Energy and Environment Institute is, is founded from. And these programmes draw on that research base. The Institute was created three years ago and to do exactly that, bring all of this together across across campus and, and we're already up to over 100 uh, uh, people brought together in, in a building on, on, on campus uh, when we're outside of pandemics at least um, and, and working together to research these topics and we take that research, that, that, that frontier world leading research and bring it into our teaching so, so that you're learning and, and, and being guided by um, in, in your studies on master's programs by people doing doing the research at this very exciting um, and, and a very important interface. So um, I'm going to hand you back to Simon and the rest of the team that will talk you through all the details of the program um, answer all of your questions towards the end as well and, and, and really try to, to demonstrate to you um, where, the, where, the, um, where, where, where these courses sit and, and, and what you can get from them in terms of future career trajectories as well. So, so yeah, I hope you enjoy the, the webinar and, and thanks for attending this evening. Um, Simon, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, if the panel could please turn their cameras on just so we can introduce you. Uh, these are the people you're going to be hearing from today. Uh, that's me on the left. Uh, I lead the renewable energy course, and my counterpart Magnus is the leader on the ECMM course. Uh, also with us, we have Ellie, Sophia, and Sean, who are three of our current students. So you'll be able to ask them questions about what things are like. I have asked them to be honest. I'm hoping I don't regret that. Um, but if you come on one of these courses, you'll probably be seeing quite a lot of me and Magnus. Whether that is a good thing, I leave to your judgment. Um, the way this webinar is going to work, um, we're going to talk a bit about why you might want to study these topics, um, and then we'll go into a little bit of detail about the modules that make up both of the courses, and try to give you an idea of why you might want to study it here rather than anywhere less good. Um, please ask us questions. This is the, really the main point of the event. Um, the way to do this, um, on the right-hand side of the screen, you hopefully see a set of controls. If you don't, you might need to click a small orange arrow to make them appear. And you should have a section called questions where you can type questions and they will appear. Uh, ask them at any point during the event. And when we get to Q&A at the end, we'll be able to see those questions and respond to them. Um, and questions could be about the course or about Hull or the region and what it's like to live and work here, or about energy matters more generally, if you like. Uh, and we'll answer as many as we can Anything we don't get to, we'll be able to respond to an email later. Uh, so uh, I'm going to pass over to Magnus for a minute uh, to talk about this little survey. Hi. Uh, I'm afraid my internet is um, 
misbehaving. I'm, I live in the frozen north, uh, about 50 miles north of Hull, in the beautiful village of Hackness near Scarborough. Uh, but the internet can be a bit shaky. So um, this is a, uh, just a question. Um, so if you go to menti.com uh, on another browser and enter the code 42302810, uh, and there will be a question there that Simon will flash up um, in a minute, and uh, we'll see uh, we'll see what you. So the the, the idea so this is a really difficult question. Um, it's basically saying which environmental issues are most critical, uh, and this is a typical kind of question. It's, I guess it's what you might call a wicked question or a wicked problem. There's no right or wrong answer here, really, but um, they're the sort of questions that environmental scientists and policymakers have to deal with um, all, you know, all the time. So you've got lots of problems. What problems do you tackle first? So I'm basically asking you um, to tell, tell us which of these problems do you think are most critical, and you put them in rank order. Um, so have a go, and let's see what, what you come back with. So as Magnus said, you want to uh, use another browser window, go to www.menti.com and enter this code 42302810. That makes me feel like a weather announcer or something. <laughs> Getting some answers in. Ooh, look at that. It's interesting uh, what people put. I'm doing it as well, just I can't resist. <laughs> this is where we try to guess from this whether most of our um, attendees are interested in renewable energy or in ECMM. <laughs> yeah, but I think like Dan was saying, um, these are all interlinked, uh, all, of these, all of these things, aren't they? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Give a couple, get a couple more responses. Well, I think the top two tell you how the people are focused on both ecology and on um, uh, renewable energy. So, which is a good thing uh, if you're attending this seminar. Uh, and like I said, I mean, I, just before I came on, I googled the top ten um, issues facing the planet uh, and looked at a couple of different web pages, and you could write a list that's twenty twenty long, but um, it's interesting. The the ones on here came from a came from one of those lists, and you know you could argue for any one of these being really important. Rising seas, you know, that's going to cause all sorts of ecological disruption, changes to plant life. Plant life is really important because it's what gives us um, oxygen. You know, water supply. That's an interesting one. So when I had a student from Iran um, last year, and she said, "Why don't you talk about water supply?" That uh, because this is the UK and it's not really a massive issue. She comes from Iran and it's a huge political, ecological and environmental issue. You know, so um, so there's lots there. Oh, we've lost the we've lost Sorry, the show. No, Simon. Coming back. He's trying to shut me up. Uh, last time we went on a little bit too long. But so just at the main point of this this bit, if if we go on to the next slide, I think, because um, I think a lot of these are listed here. But the main point is to just make you think, and the, the sort of things we all need to be thinking about personally. Um, when I think about um, the, when I step back from my day job and dropping the kids off at school and going shopping or you know, or going out in the car or going for a cycle, and I think about things, I, I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified about what might be in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And if you speak to any educated environmental scientist about the challenges that we are likely to face as a planet and as a species in the next 10 to 20 years, it is absolutely terrifying. And all of these issues here, you know, global warming, water scarcity, overpopulation is a less important one, I think. It's more about overconsumption, but we could argue, we will argue, I guarantee, if you come on this course, we will argue about these things and we will have some really good discussions. Um, invasive species is quite a quiet one that people don't think about. I mean, that's a thing where you, you can have one species turn up, like um, the grey squirrel in the UK, you know, and that's an untold amount of damage to forestry in this part of the world. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to because I'll get told off. <laughs> yeah. I know it's fishing, okay. it's not there. 
Let, let's move on. So I'm going to talk about why you might want to study renewable energy. And I think Magnus has just been done quite a good job of why you might want to study environmental change. Uh, the two are very much linked, which we'll come back to in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but why study renewables? Um, I'm going to give you two reasons. There are probably others. And if you're here, you probably have your own ideas. Um, the first one here, yeah, this is a breakdown of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 from government data. Um, and about a third of it is transport, uh, which is energy. Uh, about a quarter of it is generating electricity. 20% is businesses and public buildings, which mostly translates to heating and cooling those buildings. Um, and 20% again is people's houses, which again is heating and cooling them because it's not covered by electricity. Uh, and then down the bottom here, there's 3% in industrial processes, 2% in agriculture, and a couple of tiny slivers. What you can take from that is somewhere around 95% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions are from energy in one form or another. So our climate problem, in this country at least, is largely an energy problem. This doesn't quite hold worldwide. Um, there are some limitations to this methodology. In particular, if we outsource a manufacturing process to another country, then those carbon emissions then come under that other country's heading. So some people will say this is not a fair way of measuring it. But even if you look at a global scale, worldwide, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of emissions are from energy production. So we need to change the way we get our energy. That's one reason you might want to study it. Here's another far more pragmatic reason. Um, here again, using UK government data, this is the growth in renewable uh, electricity since 2001. Uh, various different sources and you can see how let's see first of all onshore wind kind of exploded offshore wind exploded and that's carrying on at present uh, there's also a lot of biomass going on up here and solar has been getting really significant in the last few years um, we've gone since uh, since 2000 and, well since about 2010 actually we've gone from renewables providing about five percent of our electricity to in 2018 providing 37 percent of our electricity so that's in itself as a massive success story but there is a very long way to go apart from everything else because electricity is not all of our energy use um, but this growth is set to continue um, and that means demand for people um, at present the renewable energy industry employs about 30,000 people in this country the offshore wind sector alone has said they need another 17,000 by 2030. Uh, now, there was a recent National Grid report, I say recent, it was about a year ago now, um, that looks at what, what we need to do to reach net zero in this country by 2050, as we've committed to do. Um, and for that to happen, the energy sector, they reckon, will need another 100,000 or 117,000 new people in the next 10 years. Um, so I don't know if we'll hit net zero by 2050, but if we even try, that means a lot of energy jobs. And so that's another reason you might want to study it here. Uh, what kind of jobs are these? Um, of course, we think about renewable energy jobs. We think about wind turbine technicians. We think about people installing solar panels. But there's a lot more than that. This is a screenshot uh, from a website called Faces of Wind Energy. Um, and you probably won't be able to read the small text, but just to run through a few of these. We've got a health and safety coordinator. Uh, we've got packing, we've got a design and quality engineer, we've got a, a technician, we've got a project manager here, uh, not for the actual wind energy firm, but for a trucking company, master mariner, uh, project engineer, design team leader, business coordinator, uh, project manager, civil engineer, training coordinator, procurement. So think about uh, any role that you'd have in any large industry and you'll find that in renewables. And it's not just in the companies that are actually installing the renewables, uh, it's in the whole supply chain that backs them up as well. So environmental consultants, uh, resource assessment consultants, legal and commercial managers, marketing, sales, communications, finance, survey, geotechnics, logistics, the, the list goes on. We're not about to make you a specialist in any one of those things. Um, that's fine. You're not, you're not about to drop into any of those jobs without training, but the companies will generally provide training. What we're aiming to do here is give you the broad understanding of the industry from all angles uh, to make you more employable. Uh, so the engineers will understand enough about ecology to understand what the environmental consultants are talking about. The environmental consultants understand what the engineers are saying. 
uh, finance people understand a bit of both and so forth. That's kind of what we're aiming for with the renewable energy course. Though I would note that a lot of these roles are applicable to ECMM as well. Uh, back to you, Magnus. Yeah, I, I think that's reflected in the um, the way in which students often cross uh, cross the house, if you like, or, or across the road to come and do uh, a project with. So, so last year, Simon and I had a student who was studying the reflecting superposition compound eyes of shrimps. So say, uh, the eyes of shrimps are a really good light collector, you know, and that's pure blue sky biology. And it, but there is a potential for, to use that kind of thing, uh, to, that that structure. Uh, in renewable energy. And so we, we had a renewable energy student come and work with me and Simon to sort of start looking at this problem. And, you know, we've seen RE, RE students come and look at um, fisheries as an issue around wind farms, for example. It's a massive, uh, op there, there are opportunities for, for all environmental science students to get involved in the, the everything around renewable energy. And you can see some of the jobs here that our students have gone on uh, to do from the ECMM course. So, um, and, you know, they're, they're, very, very, very varied. So there's things like um, uh, GIS systems analysis. We give you, on both courses, you'll do ge uh, geographic information systems and you'll learn to use that as a tool and that makes you employable by a whole a whole host of other people. You will develop a lot of academic skills. So we'll teach you stats and all sorts of things. And Tom, Tom Clough there is somebody who came and did the master's course and then went on to do a PhD. That's not unusual. Bailey Durant, a Canadian, came over from Canada uh, to do her, her master's here. Uh, and now he's gone back and she's doing a graduate level job as a, as a soil analysis uh, in the shale tar sands up in the far north, I think. Um, I could go on and on and on. But these these guys, you can see there's a big variety of jobs. They, they're putting themselves a step ahead of the general undergraduate population. Uh, and that's that's what a master's does, really. Um, it's, it, it gives you that extra extra lift in your career, I think. This is, this is a similar list without the nice pictures uh, from renewables. Uh, this is really from me going through LinkedIn and seeing when, where some of our students have ended up. So I'll let you have a read through of those rather than reading them out to you. I think it's just because ECMM students are more attractive than renewable well, energy students. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> and the academics, of course. Yes, yes. I'm definitely not going to say that. Moving on. No, let's, let's not. Let's not. <laughs> Um, so about the course, this is what it looks like. This is what they both uh, look like. Uh, we divide our year into three trimesters, which we actually call semesters because otherwise everyone thinks about something else. Um, and what you see here, uh, the first two trimesters are spent on taught modules. And then the third trimester is about the dissertation. So in each of the first two trimesters, you will do three modules. Uh, now you see a few more here because we're talking about two different programs. So when you see a module in green, that means it's one for just the renewable energy students. When you see one in dark blue, it's just for the ECMM students. And when you see one in light blue, it's shared between both. Um, and some people ask, why do you share these modules? And I think the response we both make is these subjects are really intrinsically linked with each other. Um, if you are installing renewable energy, it's going to have an environmental impact. Um, there's no free lunch here. We're doing it because we think the impacts of our wind farms or our solar farms are preferable to the impacts of the fossil fuels that we're replacing. But there is going to be an impact, and so we have to be able to understand and predict the consequences. Similarly, if you're doing an ecological assessment, you're probably doing it for a project, and increasingly that's going to be a renewable energy project. I don't know if you have anything further to say on that, Magnus. Uh, no, I think it's just so th th there within each of the modules there's space to pursue the things that you're interested in. So if we take the research issues module, that's something where we well, last year what we did was we looked at a horizon scan of issues in environmental science and, so, and renew renewable energy and picked some out and gave them to students as you know these are right cutting edge topics that you really need, really need to understand and gave those to students and got them to um, work in groups uh, and and sort of really uh, give a give presentations on, on, on those and well we'll talk about that, we'll talk about that module in a minute but it's just an example that you know within modules we will try to find space for you to look at the things that you're interested in um, and that, that that applies to 
the three, four of the modules that you can see in here, and in particular, of course, the research dissertation, which is the sort of capstone uh, of the of your MSc, where you get to get a chance to do something that will really impress a future employer or, or research supervisor. So, I've included this slide uh, just to kind of emphasise that point. Uh, this was a renewable energy student we had with us last year who gave us this wonderful quote. Um, and this isn't just about the two different courses either. Even within the one course, the, the renewable energy course, we have people from a really wide range of backgrounds. Uh, we have quite a few uh, geographers. We have some physicists and engineers usually. We have some environmental scientists. So there's, there's quite a spectrum. Sometimes people from outside science totally, and that's they can also add something really interesting. Um, so she was praising how she was able to get out of her engineer's mindset and work with people who are ad addressing the same problems from different angles during group work and she found that really beneficial. Um, so we say on the recruitment material that we'll take people from any STEM undergraduate subject or uh, equivalent work experience and that's true but if you're from a non-STEM background talk to us anyway because um, if you're really enthused and keen on this topic you've probably got something to offer and we'll try and uh, we'll try and have you on the course in any case. Yeah, so this year we've had a music teacher and a philosopher, uh, among other things, and they're doing fine. You know, they're having to work quite hard at some things, but they're they're getting through. You'll, everybody has to work hard uh, on a master's course, but you know, these two are having to work that little bit harder. But they're getting there. They're doing it. They're going to be fine. Absolutely. Um, so let's start going through the modules. Um, we're on semester one here, so we're starting off, and this is a renewable energy only module, unsurprisingly from the title, and. This is kind of covering all the technical side of the actual renewable energy technologies. So we give for each of the technologies, we give you a bit of introduction and uh, sorry, we start off with introduction and background for renewable energy as a whole and a little bit about how to interpret the statistics on how a country gets its energy and that kind of thing. Um, but the bulk of the module is going through the renewable energy sources, at least the main ones, and telling you how they work, what the physics are behind them. Uh, how they get designed, what the main choices are, and how one might go about finding out how much resource is available in a given location for that technology. So we include uh, wind, solar, wave, tide, um, hydro, biomass of various forms. I think that's about it. Oh, a little bit on geothermal as well. Um, so it's certainly covering all the major topics. Uh, what's next? That's uh, one of <laughs> environmental change in the Anthropocene. I don't know, Ellie, if you can you switch your, switch yourself on? I might get you to to talk to this one a little bit because you've just done it. Um, and so the Anthropocene, that is the uh, geological epoch that we're in now, um, and it's a massive, massive thing. You know, we we have changed the world. We have got rid of the North Pole. Oops. Um, so I mean, Ellie. Do you want to talk a bit about how this course is taught and what you've got oh, it, out of it, yeah. what you liked about it? Yeah, so it's um, basically broke down into four broad topics. But as Magnus said, within that, you can kind of pick what takes your fancy and what you're really passionate about within that. So you cover um, plastics, um, acidification, food supply, um, and a couple of others that's lost my memory now. But basically you do kind of infographics, so you make a poster, then we do presentations. But it's really good because it gives you kind of, you have to go away, there's a lot of personal learning, personal reading, um, so you've got to go away, do your research, and then you come up with these um, posters, presentations, and reports. Um, and as I said, you cover a massive, massive, broad subject but it's really, really good. I feel like my knowledge has been boosted. So I feel quite positive in applying for quite a broad range of jobs now, just because of the subjects that we've covered, um, specifically in that topic. So yeah, it's really good. Oh, brilliant. You did that much better than I would have done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, oh, moving on. Uh, do you want to take this one or shall I? Uh, well, it's my favourite module, I think. Uh, so Simon and I co-taught on this, and we both loved it. Well, and, and it was led by Stuart, who's the deputy director uh, of the institute. Um, it's a fantastic module. We cover a massive range of topics. We have people working from both both programmes together, uh, if they want to, uh, and 
you know, people really got to know each other quite well by working in these small groups. And it, it really helps the course gel, you know, it helps people get to know each other. And we, we did stuff, so you can see on here's a few of the topics. We did desalination plants. Uh, we did, um, there's an invasive tick that people looked at. It's horrible. Some of the pictures we saw in that presentation were gross. Um, deep sea mining, we talked about circular economy, all sorts of things. I mean, it was, uh, it, I, I mean, I, I just loved it because we were watching really good students give presentations in a kind of way that they might have to do as professionals uh, later on. I mean, also what, what do you think, Sam? real progression where the quality of the presentations improved during the semester, didn't we? Um, so people, yeah, yeah, some yeah. people were really good at presenting at the start, other people weren't so good, and they managed to really improve that skill. And by the end of it, I was confident saying that most of the presentations were better than you see at most conferences. So there was a lot of really good skills mm. building. I, I wonder whether um, Sean or Sophia wants to talk to anything about this module. Give them a chance to talk. Pick one, make them. <laughs> um, Given that they've had have training, they've had training in public presentations now. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not particularly one to uh, be, get very excited about giving presentations, but I have to say that um, the module really helped me, like uh, confidence-wise, a lot. And um, the first presentation was on how to give a good presentation, and like I completely just relearn how to, you know, give a presentation, and it's it's amazing like how how differently I was doing it before to what I am now. So. No, uh, that that has been. It was the first time we ran it last year, and it's been really successful. So, that's a definite success story. I think whoever put this slide together, well, I know it can't have been me because all these pictures are not about energy. Um, there were plenty of renewable energy projects as well, as I hope these guys will, will attest. We weren't making everyone work sure. on tips. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think, Sophia? Did you enjoy this module? I really enjoyed it. I got to meet so many people, even though it was virtually. I got to meet so many people and I still talk to them now. We still work in groups and do work together. Um, and yeah, we did so many topics. I learned so much from it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really did. Oh, we did as well because it didn't even have to rehearse that. <laughs> I, I I really enjoyed every session. I was getting paid to listen to really good talks. Brilliant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, oh, stay on stay on the line, um, Sean and Sophia. Any might want to come on. Uh, let's see what people think about environmental and energy data literacy. That's everybody's favourite module because it's taught by an academic who looks like George Clooney. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> I'm scared to let you guys talk about this, but go on. <laughs> what do you think? Personally, so, at the beginning, go. I hated it. And I actually got to the end and loved it. And I do genuinely miss it now. Um, it, it's quite infectious. Uh, you spend, spend the first couple of weeks thinking, I hate Magnus. Because it's little <laughs> snippets of work every week, but it makes such a massive difference. And I think when you look back over your portfolio, you're quite proud of what you've produced. And for me, I'd never done it before. So it was a, a whole new learning curve. Um, so yeah, I was really pleased with where I'd got to. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> I think I'd say the same, like at the start, it was so daunting, but then I grabbed, because I'd done um, Python a bit beforehand, I sort of knew where to start. It was a good ground to start from. Um, but it was a completely different software and it was difficult, but then I really enjoyed it towards the end, I have to say. I, I think I agree. But just, just to fill in, um, this is Magnus uh, giving people an introduction to programming using R and also an introduction to statistics. And of course, some people already know some of one and some people know some of the other. If you're starting from not knowing any programming or any statistics, there is a pretty steep learning curve, which I think we've just heard about. Um, but people seem to get over it. Um, people seem to get yeah, up that learning slow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I introduce a module by saying I'm neither a statistician nor a programmer. So we kind of stumble along together. But honestly, the, the quality of work that I saw from students this year, I, I can only think they had an excellent tutor because it was fantastic. <laughs> <you know? laughs> the first well, anyway, class, oh, for, absolute first class. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is semester one. Um, so we've seen, what, four modules there, and you'll do three of them according to which program you're on. Um, coming into semester two, there's a bit more of a split. Um, 
first module I have here is low carbon energy solutions. And this is a bit of a counterpart to principles of renewable energy, where principles was talking about all the generating technologies. This is talking about a lot of other stuff that affects renewable energy developments. Um, so we're talking about, uh, we've got here different ways of doing maintenance, especially offshore when it becomes really expensive. Uh, we're talking about the grid and the constraints that can put on developments. Um, and we're getting quite a lot into uh, how we measure the cost of energy, levelized cost of energy, and the, the way that government support structures and the way that, uh, uh, the way that uh, we can get paid for renewable energy uh, works and the interactions between finance and the grid, which uh, we've been covering the last couple of weeks. Um, and then the stuff we haven't got onto yet this year, uh, a little bit about storage and uh, uh, a little bit about uh, building design and the downstream elements of how we can make buildings more efficient and model and understand their efficiency. Um, and this is mostly taught by me, but this last part or some of these last parts uh, are actually taught by other people who are experts in those areas. I should have said the same as true of principles at the beginning. I probably teach two thirds of it, but the hydro is taught by an expert in hydro. Um, Biomass is taught by an extra expert, yeah, an expert in biomass and so forth. Oh, and apparently there's another map that appears here. Okay, uh, that's showing you some of the offshore wind uh, setups around the British coast, which we talk about quite a just, lot. Yeah, that's so just from my perspective there, I look at that in horror and think, look at how much space is used up. And my fishermen friends have to try and work around that. Uh, and, uh, and it causes stuff, real issues in fisheries. <laughs> um, one for you next, Magnus. So, talking about experts. So, we, uh, Laurie, uh, is an academic in uh, in the biology and marine sciences department, and this is her field, and she's absolutely passionate about it. I keep trying to take the module out because I, I, I some think it kind of, it, it, well, it does fit, but it just it's, it's quite a focused, specialised module, and a lot of the other modules we have are a bit more generous. But students love this module. Uh, I think it's taught with passion, uh, and it is a really important issue. It's one of the big five issues facing the world, I think. Uh, and each of those animals you can see there are having um, catastrophic consequences for the habitats that they're found in. That a killer amphipod, that shrimp in the bottom left there, that's a having real influences, change, making massive changes in freshwater systems across Europe. Uh, the lionfish on coral reefs, it's in places it's not supposed to be. There are predators that can't deal with it, and so it's just taking over and eating a lot of uh, the smaller fish that are found there. And of course, the horrible, nasty, vicious, uh, ratty grey squirrel that's replacing our beautiful Scottish red squirrel um, acro across the country. So. Um, all of these, all of these things are, you know, invasive species. It's a big issue, and it's it's quite good to get a module where it's very focused, but you're learning from somebody who's passionate, enthusiastic, and a real expert in that field all the way through. So, uh, yeah, it's a very popular with students. That one. That one's just for ECMM students, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This one is just for renewable energy students, um, applied renewable energy. The philosophy of this module is get people as much contact with the real world as possible. So the core of this module, instead of having lectures, well, we do have lectures each week, but they're not from me. They're not from anyone in the university. Mostly um, they are guest lectures uh, from people in the real world of renewable energy. Uh, so uh, typically we have uh, some a number of people from the actual energy industry, somebody from a regulator perhaps. Uh, we just heard from East Riding Yorkshire Council about their planning department dealing with wind farms. Um, sometimes somebody from a community energy group uh, and also occasionally some researchers from within the university on some relevant topics. We're, we're trying to get you connecting to the people who are actually doing it, who can tell you what goes wrong in the real world and what happens that we can't tell you about from a theoretical perspective. Uh, that's the guest speakers. Uh, we do site visits. Um, that's been curtailed a bit this year, but hopefully next year we'll be back to site visits as normal. Again, these can vary a bit uh, from year year to year, but last year we went to a hydro, uh, a community hydro scheme. We went to a solar farm, we went to a wind farm, and we went to a large biomass power station. Um, and we might get one or two more in uh, next year uh, if we can get those arranged. Uh, we also have a few lab practicals in this module. Um, to get you playing with some real kit as well. Um, and a, a few other things that again come and go um, from year to year, but we often have a tutorial in here uh, from a, an external tutor on the WindPro software that is used by a lot of the commercial wind industry. Uh, it's just a bit of an introduction. It means you can put it on your CV 
and some students have then used it in their dissertations where it's been relevant. Uh, so that's applied renewables. Ecosystem assessment. So ecosystem assessment is normally, again, COVID has uh, had an impact on this module, but it's normally one of the modules where we get people out in the field working with professional uh, scientists who actually live and breathe sampling uh, and sampling in the in the, the kind of freshwater rivery type environment um it's led by Bernd and he's an he's an expert on um environmental dna and we're hoping to still capture some of that this year in this module and and give students the opportunity to do something along those lines here um it's it's uh it's, it's challenging this year hopefully by by ne hopefully by next year everything will be back to normal we'll have people out cold wet and muddy uh, in the in the freshwater systems which is what a lot of people want to do you want to know it sounds i guess it sounds stupid you need to know how do you take notes when it's tipping down with rain and the, the, it's blowing a hoolie you know you've got a, a four six uh you know these skills are actually really really useful and and because you can you could so dan goes off and does field work in uh, um really uh, glamorous locations unlike the rest of us uh, and and so but imagine you travel halfway around the world to go and do some field work and you forgot something that makes of practical um ele you know that being able to co take notes collect information in the environment that's really simple like a polythene bag or a waterproof pencil or a waterproof notepad you know these things are really important and the other thing that's uh, that's that's included here is um some Con consideration of health and safety and one of the things that you will be will badger you about um throughout the course is you know when you go for an interview one of the first things you want to say to your employer when they ask you a question about how would you do this bit of field work you want to mention health and safety and how you would how you would organize your team or your group or your equipment so uh, that that field work element is really important not just for the fun of getting outside and doing some sampling but for the real hardcore employable kind of experiences that you get while you, while you're out there and it's fun as well, a really enthusiastic and fun bunch. Uh, <coughs> that leave um, so uh, next one is not showing up. There we go. Environmental impact assessment and spatial data. This is for both programs. It's shared module again. Um, and Max can probably speak better about it than I can actually. Yeah, so um, I've just been out to collect the the virtual fieldwork data for that, a sort of um, with a 3D camera, um, walking around the site that normally we would take students to, and this is a split course, not a split course, but we've got two elements to it. So one element is to teach you about environmental impact assessment. And environmental impact assessment is something that occurs every time you build a building, you put an oil rig in place, you put a pipeline in place, you you do anything uh, that disturbs the environment, you have to do an environmental impact assessment. Now, it so happens that we use quite an ecological version here, and we, we talk about voles and uh, otters, but, you know, it's the same process. Uh, and, and for our, for the ECMM students, the RA students probably will. I don't know. Are you doing something different this year? Uh, I think they're talking about uh, tidal energy, actually. Yeah. So, so you know, we try and make things focused on your topic area. But um, for the for the ECMM guys, certainly they they will be looking at voles and otters, and you know what are the likely disturbances of a gravel extraction operation there. And we walk around the site and we learn to pick up, you know. We look for otter poo to, to, you know, to, to find out whether, you know, look for signs of otters in a particular area and the, the trails and tracks that are left by animals on the site. And we do it with uh, Mike Dean, who's a guy uh, squatting down there in the photograph. He is a national expert in that area. So although he's, he's quite focused on voles and otters, he's got a very broad knowledge of the whole process and what it's like to be a working uh, environmental ecologist or environmental scientist in, in that area. The other half is uh, of the course is around uh, geographic information systems. And it's a bit like R or Python. It's the sort of thing that can make you cry because it can be quite hard, but um, mm -hmm. it's a real cool skill to have at a high level if you're looking for a job or you want to present spatial data that it, you know, it, 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 it's a, everybody needs to have it nowadays if you're an environmental scientist you need to be able to run uh, a, a gis um like arc view or um what's q q what's the other one there's a free one qgis that's it Q QGIS, yeah so you know it's a it's got that key skill in it it's got key information about environmental impact assessment and you know and it's an in, it's an enjoyable course as well yeah i'll just add to that from the renewable energy side i mean everyone needs gis frankly um 
and environmental impact assessments uh, you might be doing them if you go into environmental consultancy but even if you're not doing them yourself you're going to be affected by them if you're working in renewables so it's really important to understand what goes into them and how they work um, and I think um, I think Rodney's doing in the GIS part he's doing quite a lot about remote sensing and how to use satellite data as well isn't he which is potentially yeah. useful for quite a lot of people this is not how to uh, source data that's, that's all the modules actually yes that's a really important thing it's literally where would I look to find this data and once you start to get the knack of it and you start to get an idea of a few common sources it becomes a lot easier um, Rodney is magical like that and almost anything you want to know he'll find a way to find it out from a satellite um, sometimes it astonishes me uh, so that's that's the shape of the course um, I'll leave that slide up a minute so you can absorb it um, we haven't talked about the dissertation but this is kind of what makes a master's a master's after spending uh, two-thirds of the year uh, learning stuff uh, you get to spend the last third of the year learning more stuff but some of it will be stuff that nobody in the world knows uh, this is where you get to do a bit of real research uh, and make an actual contribution to knowledge and the main thing here is that it's a student-led project so we'll, we might suggest some topics but we really encourage you to come up with your own topic uh, maybe something during the first semester has caught your imagination and you want to look more into that and you'll be paired with a supervisor specialized in the right sort of area uh, to support you but they're not going to tell you what to do hopefully uh, it's really about the student leading the project they're interested in and getting a taste of doing real research okay I'm guessing from the silence that I haven't missed anything important out there <laughs> no. um, well, I've just been conscious of time and, and thinking we want to make, we want to give chance, people a chance to ask some questions. Yeah, we're coming to the end of this now. Um, I've got a brief slide here about why you'd want to study renewable energy here rather than somewhere else. And there's this term, the energy estuary, that gets applied to the Humber. Um, and it's a nice term, but 24% of UK's energy passes through the region. And that's not all renewable. Uh, some of it is electricity from wind farms. Some of it is natural gas that gets piped ashore from the North Sea and lands here. Uh, some of it is oil that comes through the refineries in this area. Um, but in some way, about a quarter of the energy in this country touches this region. So there's huge scope here uh, for decarbonizing that. We've also got some of the largest offshore wind farms in the world currently being built and maintained out of the Humber. Uh, this map on the right is actually about a year out of date but it's showing the wind farms that exist in the dark blue uh, are under construction in the medium blue and are planned in the white and the gray um, and these ones over here are um, Hornsey one and two which are indeed currently the biggest wind farms in the world and this is a massive expansion we have uh, major companies here Orsted who, who operate a lot of this North Sea wind have their main O&M base their main maintenance base in Grimsby just across the estuary and in Hull itself, we have Siemens uh, blade factory where they make wind turbine blades. And you can actually see them coming out of the factory and getting lined up on the quayside to be picked up by ships and taken out to these wind farms. Um, and of course, behind these big companies, we have a whole supply chain supporting them. So especially in offshore wind, but also more generally in decarbonizing industry and other renewables, there is a lot going on around the Humber. And we have a very brief video, but I don't know. We might want to save a bit of time for questions. I think let's get the video. What do you think, Magnus? Yeah, I mean, can we give a link to the video? The, yeah, the I'll, I'll, I'll two, put links to the video. You've got two videos. Huh? Yeah. Finish. Um, yeah. Make sure everyone can watch it if they want to. Um, let's see. Uh, one for you, Magnus. Yeah, it's just a, it's the last one. So it's, it, just to say, it's very similar. You know, the the Humber Estuary is a majorly important ecological um, site uh, for for the east of England. Well, internationally, really. And we've got all sorts of resources that that students can tap into. Uh, I'm particularly well connected with the fishing industry at a national level. If you're interested in fisheries, then that's uh, something to consider. We have an oyster uh, facility on Spurn Point itself. Um, you know, and Spurns, there's lots going, there's lots on Spurn, there's lots in the Humber that you can do. It's like if you're interested in um, benthic 
uh, ecology and mud, uh, then you can do stuff there. If you're interested in sedimentology, then you can you can you can do that kind of stuff. Uh, and we also have some fantastic rocky shores and chalk uh, cliffs for not too far away up Flamborough Head um, and up towards uh, Scarborough. You know, so th there's a whole host of different environments here, uh, coastal environments, but then there's lots of really cool terrestrial environments as well. I live I live in the North York Moors, um, and it's fantastic fantastic place uh, uh you know and a great place to do field work if you're interested in i don't know mammals you want to do some mammal trapping you can do that uh deer if you want to assess deer numbers a head of departments an expert in that area you know so there's there's lots and lots of opportunity within 50 miles of halt you know for for a variety of different kind of field-based projects if that's if that's what you're into but there's also uh, we have a whole lot of lab things lab lab facilities for for people to get involved in sort of um lab projects if you want to do this molecular type stuff like Ellie's doing or or environmental DNA stuff with Bernd or you know there's lots and lots of opportunity here um, I'm sure it's the same in who isn't into benthic ecology and mud sounds <laughs> Um quick last thing from me um, on the renewable energy side we do have some scholarships thanks to some generous alumni um, where you can get a five thousand pound contribution towards coming on this course um, it is quite competitive, there are only a small number available, and there are, there are some very specific eligibility requirements, but don't assume that means you won't be included. Uh, while they are very specific, they're also quite broad in terms of who is eligible for them. So the details of that are on the website, I'll give the address in a second. Uh, but do note the deadline to apply for those is in July, it's quite a lot earlier than the deadline to apply for the course as a whole. So if you are after a scholarship, you need to get that application in relatively soon. Um, so I'm not going to read that. You can read that. The main thing here is the uh, web, web addresses at the bottom. Uh, you can find a lot more information at those sites. And you can also find contact details for myself and Magnus. Uh, if you have questions after this event, just drop us an email and we'll be happy to talk to you. And with that, I think it's time to see what questions we have. Uh, let me just stop sharing my screen. Could I ask the panel to turn on their cameras, please? Welcome back. They're all still here. You haven't disappeared to the pub. Well, I suppose lockdown means you can't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the only reason Dan's still there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the question as to whether renewable energy course graduates will get a placement or career after this study. Um, the answer is we hope so, and many do. Um, I can't promise it, of course, um, but uh, the most recent year for which we had the figures, which I think is 2017-18, it takes a really tight, long time for the figures to come through. Um, I think we had uh, oh, it's something like an 85 or 90 percent rate of people being in relevant jobs a couple of a couple of years. That's why it takes time to come through a couple of years after the end of the course. So, of course, there are never any guarantees, but um, we'd like to think it's quite uh, a good course from an employability perspective. I think it's like any course, the harder you work, the, the more likely you are to do better. You you know, you get a, a distinction or a merit on your master's course and do a decent project. Uh, you've got a good chance of going on. Dan, you were... Yeah. I'm just, just going to say that, that um, there's some also some really good examples of where during, during dissertation um, uh, modules, um, folks have, um, have, have worked in partnership with with, with, with industry partners to do, undertake their research projects. So um, last year, um, a, a few a few of the the, the um, students work, worked with Siemens Energy, creating a digital twin of of, of our campus as part of um, uh, the university's 2027 um, net zero um, target that we set ourselves as an institution, um, and that they they worked with with, with that company with Siemens Energy. In, in, in as part of their part of their dissertation so 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 that gives you a great kind of real world experience whilst still doing your 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 um your dissertation research as part of your um part of your course so so those opportunities as well um to work with partners and we were very well linked in in the region to people like drax to equinor um to, to um, the various works on salt end um, uh, uh, to the catch um, to the OREC, which is the offshore renewable energy catapult. We have all of these links with with these with the industry around the around the Humber, and and, and we can help organise those placements and align 
the the dissertation with with, with partners in a way that gives you a really a rich experience um, and sets you up for the future if that's the direction you want to take your your career in the other thing i'd add to that is that certainly with the masters you very much get out what you put in um but also for something like this it's not just about the academic performance uh, it's leveraging the fact that you're doing the masters and the current students we were talking about this a bit a few weeks ago with the guy from the careers service um, it's amazing what you can get if you contact people and say, I'm a master's student studying this, will you help me? Um, and actually trying to get to conferences and events and getting to meet people in the industry uh, can actually be almost as important as the actual studies, I think, when it comes to uh, the future. Um, let's go into question for someone else. Uh, one for Magnus, which, oh, in fact, one for, one for probably one for one of the students, which programming languages do we use in the data module? Well, I'm guessing any of the students can answer that, yeah. yeah. And do you have to be good at maths, Ellie? <laughs> no, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> no, I've come from kind of out of eight, nine years out of education and come back into it, and I, I was fine, thanks to an excellent tutor. <laughs> so, to answer, to answer the question, um, that module uses R. Program oh, language. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, will, you'll, you'll be shown how to download it and you'll get access to the university and everything so don't, don't worry about that if you don't have it or you've never used it before it's it, it it's quite daunting but it's quite simple i think it helps that i'm quite simple uh, and uh, i have to work hard to to explain stuff you know and, and i think that means i understand the pain uh I mean, I totally don't enjoy the pain that students have to go through to learn, but not really. Uh, but, but um, uh, you know, I understand how difficult it is to get to that level of being able to do stuff professionally, and pr produce professional level graphics and explain complex data sets and, you know, simplify them to a point where they, they're good for a presentation. Yeah. Um, question here of... Um... Is there an option for an industrial placement after the three trimesters? Um, the answer is not formally. Um, as Dan already mentioned, some of our students do do their dissertations with industrial partners, which effectively works that way, um, depending on whether you actually spend it on site with them. Um, and also, if, if you if you were trying to arrange an internship with a company, we'd certainly help you out any way we could in terms of references or introductions. So it's not a formal part of the course. If you were really keen to do that, uh, we would do whatever we reasonably could to help you achieve it. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. There's some there's some examples where 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 we've been able to facilitate that. So one of one of my former students um, worked with with ABP on on uh, part of the 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 bathymetric surveying um, um, operations um, and did that after the course for for a period of time to garner some uh, experience um, and, and and expertise and has since gone on to to other related things as well so so there are those opportunities that come along that we can help facilitate but it's not something obviously at this stage we could guarantee or anything but we certainly help you and work with career services and others to to try and try and facilitate um the, the, those future future opportunities I, I guess you know for, for us what we want people to come out of this course with is is with excellent trajectories and go on to you know bigger and better things um in the future and 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 be able to demonstrate to people like yourself today that look come and do this course because this is the sort of things you can do afterwards so so we're really keen to to try and make sure those links happen and try and facilitate them as best we can um there are a couple of very specific questions asking, asking about specific circumstances around loans and so forth i'm not going to go into them in public but uh we will try to follow up by email on those questions. If you don't hear from us in the next week or two, then do contact us and we'll make sure we get those questions answered. Um, do we have any links with the Energy Institute or the IEMA and do you recommend membership with either? I'm guessing that's addressed on the renewable energy side. Uh, the answer is we don't have any formal links. We're not currently accredited. It's something we are looking into for the future, uh, but we're not there at the moment. Um, I would definitely recommend membership of a relevant professional body. Uh, depending what kind of energy you're interested in, that might be the Energy Institute, it might be e I e IEMA, it could be IMRS if you're more interested in marine, perhaps. Um, Magnus, yeah. the ECM is not accredited either, is it, or is it? No, but it is something. So we we have a culture in marine science of uh, we're 
accredited with the Institute of Environmental Managers, um, and so it is something that I would like to look at in the future. And uh, it's, it's forms and paperwork, but it, it, I mean, I think our our program merits that kind of reckoning. Given the marine undergraduate program merits it, I'd, I'd be very surprised if if the uh, postgraduate master's program didn't. So it is something that we 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 need to get on with. Yeah. Um, would we consider graduates from an unrelated course? Currently in my final year in property finance. Yes, please drop us a line. We'd love to talk with you and discuss it further. Um, very probably <laughs> is the answer. Uh, we might want to pick his brains or her brains, you know. So uh, yeah. maybe <laughs> about properties in finance. Yeah. Uh, is this master's program available for part time? Yes. You probably want more information than that. Um, the way it works if you do it part time is that uh, in each semester you do either one or two modules instead of the three, so that over the two years you cover all the same modules as a full time student would. Uh, the dissertation is done in the second year. Uh, if you want more detail on that, then please just drop us an email. I'll be happy to talk about it, or drop Magnus an email depending on which course you're after. Uh, yeah, difficult questions. Drop down an email. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm Absolutely. I'm a bit conscious that Sean's been sitting there and, and not had a chance to say anything. If you could sum things up in 10 or 15 seconds, Sean, what would you say about the course that you've done this year? Um, well, I'd say like, uh, well, I could go back to the employability part of it. Um, you're given all the tools to succeed. So like all the guest speakers and that like instantly after the lectures, I'm adding them on LinkedIn and it's about being proactive. So you're given all these tools and like even the lecturers like Simon and Magnus always inboxing us with all these um, conferences to go to. And I'd say I've, I've gone to more conferences this year than I did in my entire undergrad degree. So it's probably <laughs> a poor comment on me. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, but yeah. One of the few advantages of pandemic year is everything's online and we can get to stuff more easily. And I, um, I, don't, I don't think that's going to change either. I think, you know, I'm involved in, in organising some some big kind of global conferences and um, kind of hybrid models will be here for the future, which is excellent, right? It because it, because it opens up the opportunity for a much dive, much more diverse array of, of attendees at these sorts of events and 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 the value that you're able to then ascribe and take from those 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 events. So so yeah, it's it has it's it's if we don't if we don't take the learning from from the pandemic, then we'll be doing you know our, ourselves and society a big disservice because um it has has created a whole range of opportunity i would like to know what the carbon cost difference is between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic i mean now it's not just an equality thing about so people from places where they can't afford to spend two grand to go to a conference uh you know they, they now they can and but one of the things that used to annoy me is the coral reef conference every year people fly from the states and europe to the south to beautiful locations uh, and the, car the carbon cost must be phenomenal and all of these people are supposed to be environmental ecologists that, that's so, so hypocritical i always yeah. used to laugh at the international society of polar engineers who frequently have their conference in hawaii <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway i'll quickly ask a quick two more questions and i think we'd better finish for time reasons um got a question about uh whether we know of any renewable energy alumni with no science or engineering background before the masters who went on to technical jobs in renewable energy. Um, I've only been here a couple of years, so I find it difficult to answer that. I think hypothetically, I would say with no science and engineering background, you're probably not very likely to go on to do a technical job, but that doesn't mean you can't go on to do a job. There is an awful lot in the renewable energy industry that is not highly technical. And of course, I might be wrong there. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us and discuss your individual case, please feel free to do so. Glad to yeah. talk about it. Simon, the, the only thing to add there is lots, lots of work in, in, in this sector is actually project management, um, which is actually quite technical because you have to get into all the risk analysis of how, how all these big components fit together, how the program of works runs things. And then you're working in and around 
technicians and technical people all of the time, but you're working at a higher level in terms of trying to understand how it all fits together. So, so you need you need to have a, a, a broad overview, which is kind of what these courses provide, but you need to then also understand, and of course, depending on exactly which area you go into, you get the training around the specifics, but you need to under, be, be, be able to understand the technical side of things of how those things fit together into, into a broad, broader program. So, so yeah, you might not be um, hands-on technical kind of um, uh, roles, but certainly roles that interface with that and, and look at it as a broader kind of uh, overall program or project. Yeah, there's, there's certainly roles like that. And, and indeed there's a massive dearth of, of people um, in, terms of, um, in, in, in terms of the skills gap to, to address this growing sector as well. So, so yeah. That's a really good point, Dan. And I would actually, um, in Applied Renewable Energy, our guest lecturer in just a couple of weeks is a really good example of this. Um, he uh, was a history graduate and is now a team lead in Siemens Sustainable Energy and has been leading the project to audit the university campus and to understand our energy uses. Um, so, yes, um, that kind of thing does work. I think there's quite a lot of examples of people who've swapped careers by doing a master's, a conversion master's, like the ones that we're offering, really, and then gone on to do a PhD in a similar topic. I mean, I, I know of a student, Lucy Lush, she was called, and she, she did a degree in uh, media studies, and then she did a, a master's in environmental science, and then she did a PhD on rabbits, uh, and now she's... Um, She's a lead in an environmental or in ecological, I can't remember the name of the organization, but she's now a lead in an ecological organization. So she's gone all the way from an arts based media type degree through to like hardcore ecology and modeling and uh, GIS and all the rest of it. You know, so, you know, the, if you work hard, these things, what you're doing with the masses is giving yourself an opportunity. And if you work hard and get the best results you can from it and take every opportunity like Sean was talking about, you know, uh, you know, go to conferences, network, get to know people, uh, make a good impression, all the rest of it. You know, you, you're opening doors for yourself. Uh, you know, it really it is a massive, massive opportunity. Fantastic. We're five minutes over time, so I think we probably better call it there. Um, thank you very much to everyone on the panel. Um, thank yeah, you, especially to everyone who's asked questions, including those we haven't answered. As I said, we will uh, we will be capturing those and responding to them directly by email. In the event that for some reason we don't in the next week or so, please get back to us. But hopefully you won't need to. Um, and I hope to see some fantastic applications from many of you. <laughs>